Hello. In the previous three parts of this series, we went through Khan's work in a more general way, his architecture and his ideas and their interconnections. And you might have noticed that the idea of volume zero, which is the title of this series, permeates all throughout. So it's necessary to restate what I believe Khan was pointing out to was that the essence of a work of art with its architecture or music or art, painting, etc., lies in its beginning. And that beginning can only be located before the, before the beginning of history. That is, before anything has been realized, anything has been given a physical form, it lies in the deep psyche of the artist. And it has nothing to do with historical referencing of its immediate past. Our ancestors <coughs> here in India had also realized this state of silence. They called it differently. They called it the nirantar nirakar, that which has no dimension and no form. The atman, the shunya, the essence of anything that is built, everything that is built, that has an existence. It permeates all. And that is what we all aspire to be one with. Khan has always been looking at, searching for that beginning inside himself, locating himself at the beginning, before the beginning of history, in fact. And so he makes a distinction between that part of the beginning, which has no physicality, which is the, the silence and light, luminous and non-luminous happens when the work has been given a physical presence. When it is placed on this earth, that is when it comes in contact with the circumstantial elements, whether it's the location, whether it's the society and the culture in, it, in which it is built, whether it's the physical condition of the environment, all these play a part in making the building as it is. That is where it can be placed in history. Because a Greek temple is what it is because it was built at that time. And given all the circumstances within which it was built, it got this kind of a physicality about it. But the beginning of that, what it is, what it wants to be, in the words of Khan, lies in the realization or sense of the person who thought of it, who, real, who sensed that it was to come out, it was to be, it was to be given an existence. That happens before the beginning of history and that is the volume zero of history. Once it is built, it's part of the history of architecture. And therefore, now that the Khan's buildings are built, we can look at them in the historical perspective, not, again, not as a reference to the immediate past of the architecture, as most of the modern movement in architecture can be seen but in this particular case, Khan's architecture has no reference to what happened immediately. He doesn't really uh, refer any of his work to either the work of Le Corbusier, Gropius, or Frank Lloyd Wright. It's independent because I firmly believe that each of these artists, architects, also began there. And then they built. When they built, it is part of the historical process. 
So in order for us to understand and appreciate Khan's work, we will have to make this distinction. And what it is that the essence of the work is, lies in the silent crevices of the mind itself. And now that are built, we can see them, what they are and where they are compared to what was in the beginning, immediate beginning and so. I want to spend this fourth and the last part of this series looking at Kant's work in the context of the modern movement and architecture. It is important to make this distinction between modernity and modernism. Modernity is an idea. It connotes a way of being, a way of thinking and doing things more rationally. Modernism, on the other hand, is like all isms, is a plan of action, a kind of a narrative being constructed by the society to reach a particular goal. In this case, modernity is the goal. So that narrative is the one way we will be looking at, especially the narrative in architecture. Earlier, we did refer to this event in the history of architecture. In 1747, the establishment of the School of Civil Engineering and the resultant split between architecture and engineering. It may seem like a very simple event, very simple phenomenon, but it's not so simple. See, architecture was always concerned with all aspects of building activity. Whatever requires to make a building was part of the domain of architecture throughout. But with the split between the two profession, architecture and civil engineering, there was, there was a need to articulate and define two separate domains, one for architecture, other for civil engineering. And it just so happened that civil engineering ended up claiming all that was measurable, all that was rational in this all the field of architecture. That means function, which can be measured, can be articulated, uh, and structural stability went to the domain of civil engineering. Architecture was left with only that which cannot be defined that is beauty, pleasantness. And there were a lot of complaint that architecture was concerned only with now things which are not useful, um, only catering to the taste of certain level of society, certain class of society, etc. And therefore, architecture actually suffered what I consider the first crisis of confidence, a crisis of identity, you might call it. Because now architecture has to redefine it, itself, its own identity in such a way that it can regain the position it always occupied in the society. Two centuries went by in order for architecture to do so. But it happened in the beginning, something funny happened. The beauty part that was on the right side of the equation was taken on the left and a new equation was created. That is architectural beauty equals function and stability. That means that if your buildings are functionally verifiable and structurally stable, then you automatically have a beautiful building. That I believe was the beginning of rational utilitarian architecture. In this wonderful illustration by Logier, a contemporary of Peronet, shows the muse of architecture sitting on the debris of the classical buildings, pointing a finger 
and showing the way to a infant who represents architects showing him that this is where your inspiration lies a simple rustic hut made with the minimum elements borrowed from nature about a century later another frenchman cesar dali an illustrator came up with this wonderful illustration i love those illustration they are so beautifully drawn and they also contain so much meaning this one shows a procession going towards the rising sun it is led by the muse of architecture sitting on a steam engine which itself is named progress it has three wheels beauty structural stability and utility the three attributes of vitruvius they are not giving giving up those two of those three it is followed by a procession that destroys all icons of classical architecture of the past there are renaissance cathedrals roman architecture greek architecture those which are old and those which are very old and all of these are destroyed and they are now called beyond grave the old trombe beyond grave there is also a graveyard right here which in which is buried are buried all the styles of architecture you have renaissance you have roman you have byzantine you have gothic there is chinese there is indian there is egyptian all that are now buried so what is being projected here is that architecture far from giving up those two attributes to civil engineering claims all three but says that we are a rational profession the architecture is rational rising towards the, right, going towards the rising sun those illustrations were not the only one they were accompanied by some books serious books by authors whose credibility cannot be doubted on the left we see a page from a book by violet le duc he wrote this book called dictionary of rational architecture the title itself is indicative of its objective it shows a domed space made of brick brick domes supported by cast iron brackets and steel tie rods what le duc was projecting is that given the new material architecture could come up with building solution which are not only structurally sound but also as beautiful as any of the gothic buildings the other illustration comes from a book august swazi history of architecture he actually revisits the history goes back and interprets historical examples in this case for example the gothic cathedral where all the buttresses are stripped of all their architectonic qualities to say that architecture was always involved in making venustas and fornitas coexistent they cannot be separated so what it actually meant what this two gentlemen in this books are indicating is essentially rewriting the vitruvian formula now saying architectural beauty equals stability commodity is not even concerned here a few decades later and in america louis sullivan also was involved into rewriting the vitruvian formula but for him 
form follows function implied that it was the functionality of the building that lends authenticity to architecture, lends aesthetic quality to architecture. And therefore, for him, architectural beauty equals utility. So all these are attempts to hold on to the Vitruvian triangle, but reinterpret them, play around with them in order to, to develop, to evolve a new narrative for architecture. In the 20th century, the Kabuse added two more concepts, two more of the vocabulary of architecture, efficiency and abstraction. He took this beautiful section from the advertisement of a luxury liner, a steamship company, to make a point. The point being, that at that time, this were the standard building typology for housing families in, in Paris. And each building would probably be housing a couple of dozen families. Corbu made a point that it has more or less the same volume as a steamship, but the letter could house 100 and even more families in a reasonably good level of luxury, like ballrooms and theaters and a swimming area, etc., etc. So what he was talking about is that the present architecture at that time was not efficient enough and that architecture should now look at efficiency as one of the attributes in addition to beauty, utility and structural stability. He also added abstraction and in the process like Schwazi, he also revisited and reinterpreted history to say that all past architecture of whatever origin or whatever time you talk about can be reduced to the fundamental geometric shapes like square, triangle, circle, cylinder, pyramid, sphere, cube, etc. And therefore, it is this basic abstract forms that th themselves contain the element of beauty. And therefore, you don't really have to embellish them with anything else. Reality is measurable. Anything that cannot be measured or cannot be described in measurable terms is not real. Science and technology, which embody this measurable reality, are the guiding beacons of this age. And therefore, architecture too should be aligned with science and technology in this age of reason and industrialization. Together with this, there was also a consciousness of time, which is important. And it also went like this. The time is unidirectional. It moves in one direction only from primordial past, distant past, towards a supposedly utopian future in the other direction. That it goes in one direction only. Every moment, is an improvement over the previous moment, moments. Present, that is modern, replaces the past, that is tradition, which is very important. Now, we have a duality between that which is modern and tradition. That distinction did not exist, exist earlier. So now we have, we are talking about a modern and something which is not modern, Past tradition is outdated and therefore should be discarded. Modern is that which is new. Not only a duality, but also a hierarchy is being established. So that which is new of today is far better, is more suited to our life than the past, which is tradition that should be take, discarded, done away with. 
That, I believe, is the ideological and theoretical basis for what came to be known in architecture as the international style. On the left, you have Sigram buildings of uh, Mies van der Rohe. On the right, the Lever Brothers building by Skidler, Owen and Merrill. Both are beautiful buildings. And so is this, Le Corbusier's Villa Sova. These are buildings which are which have no reference to any of this building can be removed from their location and placed somewhere else also um, or very little context references so abstraction now has been taken to a level which was never imagined before these attributes these qualities of international style or modern movement and architecture also created at the time of its highest peak, around the middle of the 20th century, began to, create, began to generate some questions about the validity of this architecture, whether this is the right way of going about it or not. While the idea of international style did not last very long, maybe a couple of decades, the very search for modernity which was the basis for modern movement and architecture continued. This is Sarina's wonderful expressive building in New York TWA terminal. The Sydney Opera House by Utzon and the arena, sports arena by Kenzo Tange in Tokyo are the good examples of this. However, as this examples show, architecture was still being conceived as a complete entity, a world within the world, unchangeable, without any ambiguity, at a time when the world was changing at a faster and faster pace. Team 10 began to address this issue. This is Aldo Van Eyck's orphanage in Amsterdam, which took on the question of ambiguity, that which is in between, and the Berlin Free University below by Candelis and Shadrach Wood, which looked at the notion of things which change and that which remain constant. Those are the issues that the modern era had thrown up to which architecture began to respond. Across the Atlantic, in America, the very narrative of the modern movement in architecture came under serious challenge in the hands of the Philadelphia School. Robert Venturi, closely associated with Philadelphia School, wrote this wonderful book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, in which, though he also looked at history of architecture, he went beyond what Schwarzi and Viola Duc had done and argued that complex formal as well as ideological issues were always addressed by architects. Also at the same time, various contradictory positions were taken, even in the same building, so that one can look at this ambiguity and find one's own meaning into that. So they began to actually look at a different way of thinking about and conceiving architecture. However, what we know today as postmodern also had its genesis in this work by Venturi. Though Venturi himself in his architecture and his writings was highly serious and restrained. His buildings were full of meanings which are very important. He had also opened a door for many others to think that all we have to do 
is to embellish the functional modern building with elements of the classical architecture. And that will do the trick. Even Philip Johnson, the author of the term international style, could not resist this. In this otherwise uh, straightforward, simple, modernist tower in New York is embellished with a kind of a variation of the Greek pediment to make it look like postmodern. I will not even comment on the other examples which are presented here, except to say that I'm glad that even the postmodern idea has seems to have run out of its course. And that brings us to Louis Kahn. By locating the beginning of his architecture before the beginning of history in volume zero, Kahn has avoided this historicity, this trap of the historicity to which all other architecture belongs. It is not that his architecture is not modern. Having been realized, been built in the 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, his architecture is as modern as any other, except the fact that the very essence of the thought behind those buildings, like that of any other great work of architecture in the past, throughout history, begins before the beginning of history, as if the history of architecture was not yet written. Look at this building, the Richards Medical Research Laboratory in Philadelphia. By all account, it's a modern building, even though it does not subscribe to the narrative of modernism, it is a modern building. The very fact that all the services are kept in the towers, freeing the other served spaces, the distinction between the servant and the served spaces is a rational act. At the same time, and equally importantly, it reunited architecture and engineering. The very event set in motion this whole act of creating the narrative of modernism. Thus, whether this is the Management Institute in Ahmedabad or the synagogue in Jerusalem, not built, or the synagogue in Philadelphia, also not built, or a simple small house in the suburbs of Philadelphia, or this marvelous prayer hall in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Thus, when you encounter his buildings, it will be futile to expect them to conform, to adhere to the grammar of architecture we have inherited from the modern movement. Instead, look for the order, that which gives it the wholeness, the inevitability of everything that goes on there. Listen to these voices of silence and look for the processes by which these voices have been transformed into material architecture. It is only through this contemplation that the architecture of Khan will reveal itself to us. One would like to think that a man of such deep philosophical band of mind would be always serious. That he was while working, but he was also fond of good things in life. We celebrated his 65th birthday and when he walked into the studio, saw all these wonderful things, balloons and colorful hangings, and a large spread of fruits and cake and wine on the table, 
and rushed to open it, the bottle of wine, a large one gallon wine, and simply said, let's all have a drink. Thank you.